And today's episode, the amazing Jessa de la Morena shares with us how she dealt with and overcame a life-threatening cancer diagnosis and how she's now empowering people around the globe in the process of facing adversity, bringing them closer to their health and wellness. Welcome to the Courage to Be podcast. I'm your host, Tanya Vasayo. And each week, I will bring you amazing guests so that you can tap into the courage to break out of all patterns and live your soul's purpose. Before we get into this episode, if by the end you enjoyed it, please follow, rate, review, and share the podcast so we can reach more people. Because here's the thing, I'm on a mission to close the gender gap in the podcasting world so that more and more women's voices are heard. If you feel that this is something you value too, then please take action by rating, reviewing, following, and sharing the podcast. We can only do this together. Check out the link in the show notes to see how this is done. And make sure to stay until the end to claim some free gifts I have for you. Welcome, everyone. We have Jessa de la Morena with us today. And Jessa, I am so excited. Plus, we are coordinated in our colors today. For those of you listening and can't see us on video, we are both decided to dress up in white today. And it's I don't usually wear white that often. So this is pretty cool that we're both in sync here. I'm so excited to talk to you today and hear about your journey and share about everything that you're doing and you're putting out there in the world. So welcome. Thank you. I don't wear white either. So it's probably a big coincidence. (laughs) This is awesome. There has to be a meaning with it. So tell us a little bit, Jessa, we're a, a little bit about your journey and how you've arrived to the point you are right now in your life and what you're doing with your work. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of a long story. Now I'm an entrepreneur, I would say a fearless entrepreneur. And I got to where I am after going through a very intense personal journey due to an illness that I had. So before 2018, I was a high flying executive for a big international company doing all sorts of different roles, uh, ranging from commercial strategy to finance, to account management, to negotiating contracts. Uh, And I would travel a lot for work, um, also for pleasure, because I love traveling and learning about new cultures, et cetera. I'm half American, half Spanish. And I was leading a very intense life of a lot of enjoyment and a lot of hard work. So kind of my motto was, you know, work hard, play hard. And I would really enjoy when I would have time off, but it was true that I I really worked quite a lot and, uh, and would just do a lot of activities. I was very kind of entrepreneurial in a sense of like creating things and starting a network for professional women in the company and doing just different things that I found interesting. I also got certified as a coach because I really liked that. And I was, I'm the typical person who has like 10 books that I'm reading at the same time and I'm very (laughs) curious and all this, you know, but then yeah, in 2018, I went to a routine doctor appointment and found a terrible diagnosis that I had cancer and basically my world stopped and I was pushed off the hamster wheel, (laughs) if you will. And so I went through a very uh, tough time going through lots of different treatments. I also chemotherapy, radiation, you know, the works. And I also decided to make a very detailed plan for myself of things that I could take care of and take control of in the situation. No. So given that had happened to me, I decided, okay, well, what are the areas that I can do something about Mm -hmm. apart from doing the chemo and the treatments. And so I was inspired by a book written by Kelly Turner called The Radical Remission. And she's a Harvard PhD and she studied what were the nine factors that were present in in radical remission cases. So she talks about the different areas ranging from meditation, nutrition, positivity, support network, all these things. So as a good executive, I sat down after about three weeks into the treatment, I sat down and basically made a plan for all those areas and decided on the different actions I was going to take. So while I was going through the the physical treatments through with the doctors, I was also very intensely 
going through other activities that were contributing to my well-being. And so I was doing this very intensely because I felt that there somehow was a connection there. I wasn't sure exactly what that connection was, but somehow I felt like if I didn't do that, I wasn't doing everything in my power to try to get better. So I had a lot of pressure in a sense of saying, okay, I need to do everything I can. You know, I have two little girls who are not so little anymore, and I'm not going to leave them here and on this earth by themselves. I mean, they have a father, obviously, but I want to be here for them. And I just was in, intent on getting through that. And I did. And so six months later, I had a radical remission. And that changed my life dramatically because... I had gone through such an intense process of emotional and mental healing through this process that I went through that I started, basically, I kind of found this inner strength that I didn't know I had. And I started questioning everything in my life and, and why I was doing things and why I had made certain choices. And I, I started realizing that actually a lot of what I thought in my head or my thoughts were not actually really me. It was more like potentially thoughts that I had learned through your parents or your culture or your society or your friends or different things. And, and because you're on that hamster wheel that I was pushed out of and we live such hectic lives, right? With the society that we live in now where everything just goes so fast, we don't, we don't stop and question, you know, why we're doing things. And so that gave me the opportunity to really do that. And it really brought me back to the present moment and made me very aware of the fragility and uncertainty of life and really made me want to just be in joy all the time, you know, like really be doing things that were very significant for me and that were really, truly bringing me joy. So my life changed then. I continued in the job I was doing. However, I started working in a different way and I was fine health-wise for another year. And then unfortunately I had a relapse and I had a metastasis and it went to my lungs. And then I had to go through three surgeries and another cycle of chemo. And then finally there was a point where there was no more that could be done. And I was pretty much being told, well, you know, either you get surgery, which is a very unconventional thing to do, or you just go home. And I obviously was not going to go home. So I had to go to numerous surgeons until I found one that was willing to do the surgery. And I was very lucky to find a, a great surgeon. And so I had half of my lung removed. And then that was last year, April. And now I'm cancer-free and I have immunotherapy every three weeks. But this period of time where I had the metastasis really was a, a much deeper change for me because not only had I basically took on the learnings that I had from the first experience and went much deeper into kind of like the actual pillars of my life. And so at that stage, I just knew that I didn't want to continue working in what I was working in. I really loved the people aspect and the people I worked with, but I wanted to do something with, with kind of like something that was very significant for me and that, you know, allowed me to kind of do things that were more satisfying for me, you know, like that allowed me to be more creative. And I wanted to be kind of more in sync with my interests and my passions and also the intellectual piece, which I got from my job, but I wanted to do it for something that I found like really, really meaningful. Now. And so during this time, what happened was that I created a blog because I realized that at work, I started sharing my story very actively in presentations and I would use it as a metaphor when I would do like Ted talk style presentations. And I would use my personal story about disruption as a metaphor to how we can deal with disruption in our business or in our lives in the sense that disruption is really an opportunity, right? It brings you the opportunity. It gives you the license to think differently, to do different things, to question everything, to come back and actually say, wait a minute, you know, like, let me go back to my essence and, and start like really and have, you have a fresh canvas to just start drawing on and deciding it gives you power. And so I started sharing my story and realized that a lot of people were being empowered by my sharing my story. So then I thought, well, wait a minute, you know, I really had tried to stay away from most information I would find on the internet or on social media because it was very negative. I found that 
everything I saw was bringing me down and it wasn't making me be inspired. So I really kind of stayed away from everything. And so I started thinking, well, I'd love to create a community for others that are going through these types of situations where they can find that inspiration because when you're exposed to transformation of others, you realize and see that you too have that same possibility. You know, it's like when someone finds their inner hero or their inner kind of strength and then you see it and you say, well, wait a minute, this person is a person just like me and I can do the same. No. So I started a blog and people started sharing their stories from all over the world. I would translate the stories. We had them in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. And with friends who helped me do this while I was going through the metastasis. And after that, when I went back to work, I realized that I actually wanted to really do this full time. Like I was enjoying it so much and I wasn't sure what it was going to look like, but I wanted to really work on it. So at that point I decided, okay, what's missing here? Like what's missing apart from the inspiration that you can get? What's the other thing that's missing? And since I have been through something like this, it was very easy for me to, to determine what was missing. And what was missing was the connection to that word of mouth referral that you get from your friends and your family and, you know, people that you trust who tell you about that doctor or that psychologist or that coach or that yoga teacher that was really instrumental in helping them get through something difficult. And so what also I learned was that actually there's a transversality that, that goes across any adversity meaning that you may be going through a physical illness or you may be going through a, a mental illness or you may be going through something emotional or a divorce or COVID or whatever it is, but it can, it's going to potentially, that trauma is going to affect you mentally and emotionally and, and spiritually. And so I learned about a lot of things that I tried, a lot of different complementary therapies and different therapies that I tried and that were very helpful for me. I learned from people who were going through totally different things than I was. So I was really trying to connect with people that were very positive. And these people maybe had migraines or had issues with other things. And they would tell me about therapies they tried that were very helpful. So I basically would try things based on their recommendations. So I decided that I needed to incorporate that into my blog. And so the way to incorporate it was to create actually a platform. So at this stage, I was just so passionate about doing this because for me, it was much more than just like an entre, you know, just doing something. I mean, this was, for me, it was about transforming this really bad experience into something really good that could help a lot of people. Because when you get down to it and you start questioning, like, why is this happening to me? You know, why me? Why twice? Why, you know, all these questions. And there are no answers to that because you just, it's a lottery, right? It's not genetic. You don't know why that happens to you. And you try to find the answer to that question and there's no answer. Well, then you can create that answer. Now you can decide that you can transform adversity into opportunity. And so that's what I did. So I left my company, the company I was working for and created my own business, began the development of this platform, which is an app. And it's called You Are The Hero. And it's called You Are The Hero because in my process, I discovered that I was the hero that I was looking for, right? That I discovered that I had the strength within. And that's part of that transformation where you get empowered. And when you go through these things that you, or are exposed to things like this, you discover that power that you have within and that knowledge that you have within. And I just realized I used to be, I'm a very pragmatic person, but I would like to hear like different opinions and kind of when I was making a big decision and, or I would maybe analyze a lot and I was a very mental person. And now I'm like the total opposite. I mean, I know within myself when, what I want and what I don't want and what's right and what's wrong. And it's like, I'm much more connected now to my body after having gone through a lot of this wellness activities that I did. And basically the other big thing is that obviously having gone through this illness twice really mm, made me kind of fearless in a sense, because the biggest thing I can fear is not being here for my daughters and for my family, obviously. But the thing is that you just, you realize that everything else is just, you know, small stuff. No. So, you know, that fears are, it's basically there are things that are made up in your head. No, I mean, obviously there's things that are like real 
dangers out there. I'm not talking about those, but I'm talking about the, those fears that we have in our head that don't allow us to maybe take that step and do follow your passion and do something that you really want to do. And you've been dreaming about all your life or, you know, we don't do those things because there's ideas in our head that we think are real that are holding us back. And it's kind of like, I like to think of like fear, you know, the false evidence appearing real. It's like things that are that are in your head that hold you back. Like you think, oh gosh, you know, no, I have a stable job in this company. And if I go, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do things. And it's like, you've been figuring things out all your life. Of course, you're going to be able to figure it out. Or you think falsely that a job is stable. You don't know. I mean, you don't know. There's going to be a pandemic. There might be a change in the management in the company, and then your job is no longer, you know, you're made redundant or whatever. I mean, anything can happen really. So it's like, it's just so sad to think that you're holding on to something, you know, like your <laughs> like life job. depends on it. Yeah. And, and it's like, it's keeping you back from maybe fulfilling really dreams that you might have, no. And in my case, I always loved, loved helping people. Like for me, it was like when I was doing jobs that, that I wouldn't enjoy some parts of them so much, the part that what would make me like self-motivate was to think, okay, I, I might not be enjoying this specific activity, but I'm really helping that person. So I would really kind of turn it around. And that was the way that I would get through it. So, and even looking back, my mom now says to me, her, when you were coming out of college, we asked you, like, I had decided to study business, but she, you know, we were saying, well, what would you like? And I was just like, I would love to be a coach, or I'd love to, you know, be a professor. And it was like, yeah, but you're 21. I had just graduated. I was 21. And they're just like, I mean, what executive are you going to go tell what to do? You know, even if you study coaching, you study this. And it was kind of like, yeah, okay. And, <laughs> but it's like, you know, it's like, I've kind of done this whole 360 where it's like those things that I had inside, which I was really passionate about are the things that I'm doing now. And I'm teaching it also, you know, um, at a, in an MBA program at an international school here in, in Madrid at the Instituto de Empresa, Transformational Leadership, which is something I also studied and did. And so it's like, I just kind of, it was, it was a question of saying, okay, well, you know, now that I have this blank slate, you know, my life has been broken to pieces all over. And now is my opportunity to really make choices and decide what things people time, like, like everything that I spend my money, time, people, you know, everything is going to be based on what brings me joy. <laughs> and that's the only criteria. So that's huge. So yeah. That yeah. is amazing. And, and there's so many questions and parts that I wanted to like dissect within the story. You know, I love that, that the business that you started is called, you are the hero. You know, it's, it's so based off of Joseph Campbell's, you yep. know, the hero's journey. You know, if you think about it of just going, I don't know if that's where you came up with the name for it, but it's just, it's, you go out there into the world, you've been in the world, something happens, there's this threshold, you go through the hard moments, and then you come around and you bring it back to the tribe, you bring it back to your people, you know, and helping them. So I love this idea of how you've brought the, the hero's journey all back into it. And, and you are the hero, you know, like we are the hero all the way from within, and it's yeah. a great name, you know, I'm so happy to hear this, Jessa. It's really There's... interesting, Tanya, that you say that because I had not made the connection with the Joseph Campbell book, which I'm familiar with and have read, um, but there is an absolute connection there as you're just describing. And so that's really interesting for me. The reason why I called it that was, is that for me, it was like this huge discovery of, wait a minute, I think we've been taught all our lives. Like there's and then actually the, the World Economic Forum has declared that we're in an era of disempowerment right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's like we've been taught that, you know, there's the institutions and the doctors and those people are the people that know, you know, and they're the ones. And then, you know, it's like as little girls also, you watch all the Disney movies and there's like the protector and the prince that comes and help you. And it's like you you have this thing where you know, you kind of think that someone is going to come and figure it out for you and save you and do whatever. And so for me, the big eye opener was I've always been a very independent and very active person and a very resourceful person. However, there was this piece of me where it's like, you're there sitting there in front of that doctor who has your life in their hands, right? And they're telling you these things. 
And you just have to kind of, you just have to, be, you have to just believe them, no? And so for me, it was like, I learned to just say, wait a minute, like, does this feel right? Does this, you know, and so I started, I would listen to them, but then I just would go in and say, okay, how is this making me feel? And then I would, and I made decisions that people were like, how are you making these decisions? And it's like, I have no medical background. I don't know, you know, I mean, I've learned through what I've been living, but I was starting to really just listen to myself much more. And so for me, the name was that it's like, that was my big discovery. It's like, you know, you're the hero you've been looking for. <laughs> like you have that strength within, no? And so that that's why I called it that, no? Just so to tell people, it's like, you're the hero. Like, you know, we all have a hero within. You just, you just have to let it out. You have to unleash it. And yeah, I love that. <laughs> I think it's great. And I, I would definitely revisit Joseph Campbell's, you know, like the yeah, whole hero's I journey, will. because I think you've done the whole hero's journey, even though it, it had nothing to do with it, you know, and that that's where the title comes, because what you're saying, we could do like a whole other podcast on that, too, <laughs> of just kind of becoming an advocate for yourself listening to your own intuition, you know, tapping in to that hero within, you know, because a lot of times we're looking for those answers outside of ourselves. And it's not to say, if you're going through some, you know, like anyone that's listening, if you're going through some major health issue to not listen to doctors, this is not I don't want you to misinterpret this like this, you know, that's not what Jess and I are talking about. It's more of listen to the, to the experts, listen to the science, but also listen to yourself because sometimes the science, you could be that exception, you know, the one in the million, you know, like when they said Mm -hmm. you either get an operation or you go home and die. Well, that's your choice. You know, like, are you, are you wanting to listen to the doctor and go home and die Or are you wanting to advocate for yourself and saying, no, there has to be a solution, you know, and I know there's a lot of people, again, I don't want to take away because there's a lot of people that have gone through cancer, that have lost that battle, that maybe have tried different things, or even any other type of illnesses doesn't have to be cancer. But what I want to point out of what you're saying, Jessa, I've just really not abdicating your power to the people that know more. It just does it. All you can do is listen to the people that know more, meaning the doctors or the scientists, and at the same time, do your own research, listen to your intuition, to connect with other people that have gone through something similar, even if it's not the same illness, you know, or condition or whatever they've been diagnosed with, which I love that you were saying that you would connect with other people and listen to someone that's going through severe migraines, not a cancer. And what kind of therapist have you been using? And that's the thread that I hear in all of this, Jessa, that I just want to reflect back to you. I know you already know it, but it's just your thirst for curiosity and wanting to learn more, you know, like you've been thrown into this adversity and, Mm -hmm. and flipping it around and saying, okay, having your pity party, crying it all out. Cause I'm sure that has to be scary as hell to get that diagnosed. And, but then saying, okay, what, how can we turn this around? You know? And Mm -hmm. so there's, uh, there's so many questions I have for you. So as you're going through something like this, because we're, ta- we're hearing your, you know, the heroic part of the journey, can you share with us a little bit too, for anyone that's listening, like, well, that's easy for her to say, because she already overcame. Well, that's easy for her to quit her job because she got diagnosed with cancer. Like, what could you share with someone that just got a bad diagnosis, whether it's cancer or any other condition? when they're going through that fear state of like, oh my God, it's the end of the world. I don't know. I don't even know how to confront all of this. Like what would be some words of advice that you could give someone that's in that position right now? Yeah. That you are in three or four years ago. Not where you're at right now. And I know. And well, the thing is that to a certain extent, it's like, I'm still there because I mean, I have immunotherapy every three weeks. People, people don't, 
that's another thing I think it's very interesting that people don't understand that they think it's like it's over because I'm, you know, I'm cancer free and it's over, but it's not over. I mean, I go through therapy every three weeks. I have to go back. I have my port and I go every three weeks and it makes me tired. I have side effects every three months. I have scans that are scary as hell because I don't know what they're going to say to me. And I mean, a lot of people like don't understand that it's not over when it's over. (laughs) You know what I mean? Thank Um, you for explaining that. And so how do you overcome those fears too? Because it seems like well, different have, stages of fear, you know, from yeah, the diagnosis. You have, you have to work to on that. Yeah, you have to work on that. And actually, I talk because I do a lot of a lot of people contact me to help to ask for support, like because I do coaching, and then people are asking me to coach them through their adversity. And because I do go to the hospital every three weeks, and because I came out with this app at my hospital, for example, and all the, well, I go to, I have in three hospitals, but they're very supportive of, of this whole initiative because they think it's a great resource for people. They always introduce me to the newbies, to the people that are coming in for the first time who are really scared. And I, and it's like, I know what that feels like. Right. And so like, I usually, when, when I go, I end up having my treatment in a room with someone else who it's their first day because they're, the nurses are like, or the doctor will say, do you mind like talking to them and explaining and going back to this? It's like when people get through, I tell them, I say, listen, when you're going through this, you're in your adrenaline is super high and you're going through a lot of fear and a lot of things that are extremely hard. And yes, you're going to cry a lot and be, and it's going to be very scary because you're, you're doing things that you've never been exposed to. You might be afraid of needles. You might be afraid of, you know, maybe you've never had surgery. Maybe it's like, there's lots of things that you have to like the chemo, what is it going to do to me? Like, and then, then you're sick and you feel nauseous. I mean, there's all these things that you, that you go through. The thing is that that adrenaline like really works in your favor and keeps you kind of in this mode of like, I need to get through this. I need to get through this. And you just, it just pushes you forward. Right. But when it's all over, then it's like, you're left with this oh my God, now I have to digest (laughs) like all that fear that I went through. And I have to digest the fact that now moving forward, I am very aware of the fragility and uncertainty in life that I was not aware of before because I lived in automatic pilot, just, you know, planning five years from now, I'm going to do this two years from now, I'm going to do that. And, And now it's like, I can't even think a day from now because I don't even, you know what I mean? It's like your whole just mindset changes. And so I tell that to everyone who I was just having a conversation the other day with, with a girl who I helped through, who I kind of like mentored through a bit, the, her whole process. And she's finished now and she's, she's back to work. And she called me like, just really upset the other day. And she was saying, you know, I'm having anxiety attacks and, you know, I'm going through a really hard time. And I said, of course, I said, I mean, this is even harder, maybe than that other part, because you don't have the adrenaline, no? And so it's, now is the time where you have to digest all of that. And then you need to learn how to deal with this newfound uncertainty that you are aware of. And so there's two ways, like, in a sense, there's two pieces to it. No, there's the piece that that uncertainty keeps you in the present, which is a gift, because it makes me realize that I need to make sure that every single moment counts and that everything I'm doing is my choice and that I'm not losing time or wasting time with people that maybe I don't want to spend time with or that I'm doing things that are chosen by others that I didn't choose. Or, you know, I mean, obviously it doesn't mean I I don't, I'm not flexible and I go along with other things sometimes, but it's like, I want to make sure that, I mean, I need to take care of myself first. And then many times we don't even realize, you know, like we might say, oh, you know, in order to, to keep myself sane, I'm going to like say, I don't know, a family member is coming that I don't like. And then I'm going to get, I'm just going to head to a hotel and leave like the house so that I don't have to be with that person daily. And that way, you know, it just keeps the peace and it keeps everyone sane. But it's like in that decision, if you really think about it, Yes, you can think to yourself, I'm doing this to keep myself sane, but you're putting yourself last. Like, why are you leaving your home? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, I know this is a really silly example, but Mm -hmm. it's just, it's very like illustrative of of saying, like, you're actually saying, okay, this person is coming, they're invading your space. (laughs) It's your home and you're going to a hotel because it's going to make you, it's going to keep the peace. And that calms you down because that way you feel less anxious. 
And it's like, yeah, but you're not, it's like, you're not dealing with, with really, are you being loyal to yourself first? Yeah. You're sacrificing and, yourself before. And I think that's a lot. It goes back to what you were saying at the beginning. This is a big problem for women in particular. Yeah. I know some men can have it too, especially like empaths or, you know, like sensitive, but if, if you are, this is how we've been raised, you know, it's, it's especially yeah. with patriarchy, you know, it's just these beliefs of we have to care for everyone else. And we place our value as women on how much we give, we nurture and care for everyone else. And so it's such an important point, like you're saying of what a great gift that you were given with this, but mm -hmm. at the same time, and this is a question that I wanted to come back to. Yeah. What would you suggest to people, for people. Yeah. that have not gone through any type of wake up call, you know, with a life threatening illness, condition or accident, trauma, any fill in the blank that we are still gliding through life on that hamster wheel that we are not putting ourselves first. Yeah to come back to this place of reflection? Or do you yeah. think that you need that four by four wake up call? No, I think that first of all, you need to get off the hamster wheel. So you need a little bit of time. I mean, it doesn't have to necessarily be huge time, but the hamster wheel continues over the weekend, meaning like you're in the hamster wheel during the week with work. And then it's like on the weekend, then you continue with all the other activities, like whether you have kids or not, you're probably doing loads of things or you're turn you're just like disconnecting by maybe just like sitting in front of the TV or reading or whatever, which is totally, you know, a decision. It's a way of resting and that's great, but it's like, take some time to stop and actually say, okay, like, what are my values? No, it's like, just, it's as simple as taking a list. You can go online, type in values, list of values, and you'll get like a list of like, you know, a hundred and or 500 values. Try to figure out what your top 10 and then top five values are. I guarantee you that will be a whole like three day activity because it's like really hard. And then once you've done that, then look at your calendar and start looking at like, look at your calendar and see, okay, where, what am I dedicating my time to No, and see if they're aligned, you know, and say, wait a minute. Okay. And then use that as when things come up that, you know, you're proposed a plan or something. If someone says, oh, would you like to do this or a new project or whatever? Go back and say, you know, does this, is this aligned with my values? And so that's a kind of an easy way of just like starting to, starting to peel the layers of the onion, because this is like a long journey. And then you start realizing and you start saying, wait a minute, like, and you say that when you catch yourself saying, I have to go do this, it's not it's if I have to, who says, is it that I learned this as a kid or is it my mom's voice who's saying that, or who is it? And if it sometimes, many times it's you. And then the question is, it's like, I'm saying I have to finish this by this time. And then I ask myself, but well, why, like who says, and then it's like, mm -hmm. actually it's not, it's okay. Is it, <laughs> I mean, is it gonna, you know, I don't have to finish this today. I can uh -huh. finish it tomorrow. No. Can, so, I, can I ask you for an example with this? Because I think it for listeners, like what would you say are your top five values? Then how did you start calendaring things within your calendar so that your values are met? And then if you could give us an example, I don't know, maybe recently something was presented to you where you had to set a boundary because you're like, eh, no, that doesn't align with my values. Can you give us an example yeah. of that? starting out yeah like, i mean your top my, five I mean, values my values obviously top one is my health right so for me it's i mean i need my sleep i need my nutrition you know it's like i need to be you know i don't want to be stressed out because being stressed out stresses me out because i think it might make me sick i mean this type of thing so that's my top one and then my second one is obviously is my family is having like a healthy, good, close relationship with my children and my family. And then the next piece, because I'm a very people person is, you know, my, like my friends, that for me is very important because a lot of them are my family as well. And then, and then it's basically, you know, I, I want to help people 
Like it's just, uh, I like, that's just something that just brings me a lot of joy. And for me, that's really important. And yeah. And then I guess the the fifth one is just being in joy. You know, it's like, it's just being happy and, and, and enjoy. And so I guess, you know, the question comes where you start thinking, okay, if my health is important, then I need to make sure that I'm prioritizing that. So if that means that I need to do exercise or I need to eat in a certain way or whatever, it's like, I need to make sure that that is in my calendar first. Like if you take a blank calendar and fill it, then you fill it with your eight and a half hours of sleep every day. Like you put your, you know, that, so mm-hmm. that's like the priority, you know? And so, or, you know, I want to have a great relationship with my kids. Well, that means that I'm going to make sure that in the moments when they are available or and receptive. So for example, like, I try to be there to pick them up from school because I know that time from like riding home, we talk and and then they get home and then they start studying. Right. And so then that time, it's not so important that I'm there because they're busy with their things. They're then I want to make, I want to be there at dinner. Right. So then I make sure that I'm available at dinner and I want to then spend a little time after dinner where we're going to like hang out or we might play a game or we might watch a show that we're watching together or whatever. But that, so if for me, you know, that relationship is important, then I am really better have some quality time put in the agenda that's blocked for that. Like there's nothing that's like, I mean, sometimes things come up and you have to, you know, but then Mm -hmm. I try to make up for it. No. So for me, it's like, it's making sure that the actions that will lead to you having the outcome that you're looking for based on your value are being taken. So That's you have awesome. To, so it's, mm-hmm. it's a question of saying, and then you have, you have, so I have my executive meeting with myself every, you know, a couple of weeks or three weeks where I stop and I say, Hey, what's going on here? First of all, there could be potentially a shift in some, some things that are important to you, your values, mostly your top five are going to be your top five, Yeah. but there might be a shift that comes about because something has changed in your life. Okay, fine. Maybe something health wise came up. And so now that becomes like a huge priority for you. But it's like you check in with yourself and say, okay, are these things that are, you know, are important. And then really look at what you're dedicating your time to and see if they're aligned. If you've maybe veered off a little bit without noticing because you're just following kind of maybe the people around you and you know, whatever, maybe you started dating someone new and that person you know, has certain uh, habits and then you're, you've kind of adapted there. And then it's like, wait a minute, you veered mm-hmm. off and you're not following, you know? And so I think it's a question of also being consistent and checking with yourself. And then the third piece that I think is super important is that when you're connected to your body, which like doing meditation and this type of thing helps you do. And when you're connected, then your mood or your emotions are going to indicate to you when you're, when you're aligned and when you're not with your values. So if you're feeling, for example, like nervousness, not excitement, but like anxiety or a bad feeling, or, you know, this is not a nice feeling, stop and think, okay, what am I thinking? No. And so you're thinking something that's making you feel bad. Right. And so it could be the thought of, oh, I have to go now to visit so-and-so And then you just go, wait a minute, I really don't want to. It's like, it just, I don't want to do that because of whatever reason. Well, your body and your emotions are telling you things. And some, so many times, and I'm the first to say that this was me before, um, you know, before this happened to me, but I would just ignore that and just go, just get on with it. it. I think, do you think part of it too I don't know. It could be cultural. I feel like the Spanish culture versus because both you and I are the same. We're mutts. We're half Spanish, half American. So I think there's some differentiation with culture. Like, I don't know. I just had to interject there because I remember growing up in Spain, people would go out partying, like say your value is health now. And you're like, oh, well, we're going to do a dinner at 10 o'clock at night. Then we're going out for some drinks then we're going to go to the club and we're not going to come back home until four in the morning. Let's just as an example. And you check in with yourself and you're like, Ooh, no, that's not feeling right with me because I need my nine hour sleep. I go to bed early, fill in the blank. That's at least how I feel identified because one of my values too is, you know, like sleep to me is super important. But anyway, I have found that when I go back to Spain and I visit then people are like, 
what do you mean? You're like, you might say, I'll join you in the dinner. I'm just not going to have dinner at that time, you know, because I eat a little bit earlier or I'm not going to go after the dinner, you know, like I'm just joining you for the dinner. I feel, I don't know if this is a Hispanic cultural thing, this pressure, everyone's like, what do you mean you're not staying for the, why aren't you eating at the dinner? Why aren't you eating with us? What do you mean you're not going to the club afterwards? And there's this constant pressure instead Mm -hmm. of just respecting the value or the, the boundary that you've set, you know, like, yes, I will join you. And because I don't find that as much here in the US, like when I, and I don't know how much is a woman thing too, where we try and please everyone. And so we sacrifice our own values and boundaries with that. Could you talk a little bit about that, Jessa? Like, do you think this is a cultural thing? Do you think this is a woman thing? You know, like what, how do we kind of overcome this? You know, because it's not that easy sometimes when you have the peer pressure of everyone else, like you said, you get deviated. I love this executive meeting with yourself, which I also wanted to ask you about, but can you tell us a little bit about this? Like, do you think this is a cultural thing, a people pleaser, Mm -hmm. woman's beliefs that have been ingrained? I think it's a mix. So I think women definitely are taught to be selfless and especially like, and it's just a thing of like, taking care of others and we end up kind of putting ourselves last. And I think that's something that we think just kind of a general thing. I don't think that's a cultural like Spain or yeah, US or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is true that for example, with the example you gave, I mean, I get that a lot too. And then, you know what, sometimes like, for example, I had not been out in like four years and I'm, I love to dance. Like dancing is one of my things that I love. And it's so funny that we're talking today about this because like I haven't been out, out, well, with COVID and then I, I was sick and I'm out, everything was going on. So it's like, I hadn't been out in, in four years. And literally this Friday, I decided I had this thing. It's like, I had an itch. Like I really wanted to go dance. Like that was, I just decided, like, I really wanted to. So usually, I mean, at 10, I'm like totally passing out. And I, I just <laughs> decided I wanted to go, I wanted to go out. And so, you know what? I went out and, you know, <laughs> I got home at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> I love it. Which is really funny because seriously, like I will I mean, most people know that I'm a zombie by 10 at night. My daughters, like they tuck me in basically. I mean, and that's just how it is because, you know, that's, that's my choice. And, and I set that boundary and I get a lot of pushback generally from people, but they know that's just like, you know, once in a while, I'll, obviously I'll make an exception because I'm not going to be like, you know, a total, like sometimes maybe there's a really special occasion, like New Year's, or I don't know, there's a special occasion, and then I make exceptions. So I'm not going to be like super rigid about it either. But in general, that's my lifestyle. And that's what I want. And if you don't, if the person around you doesn't respect that, then or the people around you don't respect that, then, you know, it's their problem. Like, it's not personal. It's that's just what you know, who you are and what you like, you know, and then, like I said, once in a while, you might do something a little bit, whatever, maybe uncharacteristic, but it's because you really feel like it or, you know, maybe there's a, an exception that you want to make. When I was sick, I, you know, it's like I used to be a total people pleaser. And I think I learned this growing up because I moved around a lot as a kid. And I went to like a zillion different schools. And so I had to, I was like a chameleon. I had to fit in everywhere. And and so I learned that I was like, I wanted to please everyone. So like, I learned to hide who I was because like I would be in certain places and they would be like, oh, you live where? And it's like, then people would treat me the same. So then I would make up, people would say, oh, well, high school, I don't know you like, well, high school do you go to? Oh, and you know, in a different part of wherever, no. And so I would kind of, I just would, kind of be a chameleon, fit in where I was. And I just learned to do that, but it was a survival mechanism. Right. And then it gets to a point where, where you're older and then you realize, okay, like I don't need that survival mechanism anymore. I can be who I am and, 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 and be, and, and I need to be who I am because that's how I'm going to be loyal to myself. Even with my illness at the beginning, when I would go out and see people, like I would go to the office and see people and people would come and be just so kind and so thoughtful and, you know, just, they were, you know, devastated by what was going on and like hug me and be very, you know, just so nice. And then people would try to con- like, they would want to like connect with me and, and empathize. Right. And the way to empathize was to share with me a story about something related to like to cancer. 
right? So the first time this happened to me, that someone said to me, oh, you know, after giving me a huge hug and they're crying and you're almost like having to uh, solve them, <laughs> help them. Yeah. And then, and then they tell you, oh, you know, like, gosh, yeah, you know, my mom had cancer and she died and you go, okay, now oh, you're just kind of shocked. Right. And then you go home and you're like devastated because like, I, was that helpful for me to hear? No. You know, and then you think, well, okay, that person, they said it with the good intention. They were trying to connect with me and, and show me like, yeah, I know, like somehow, like I, Re I know reciprocity of some sort. Yeah. Exactly. But that was like, it just killed me. I didn't sleep that night, whatever. So I decided, you know what? No more. So the next day I, same thing, you know, it's like, I run into someone that I hadn't seen in a while and they find out whatever. And then, and the same story starts. And then I start seeing that they're about to tell me something. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm like, hold on. Can, you know, I'm like, are you going to tell me something that is super positive and it's going to be inspiring for me? <laughs> that and is she awesome. Stopped and she looked at me and she's like, actually, I was going to share something that happened. And then I said, okay, well, you know, I, I so appreciate, you know, you, your, you know, your thoughtfulness and everything. And I just need to ask you to please, you know, right now I'm not in a place where I can, where I can hear things that maybe were tough for you. And I'm maybe at another moment, I will be able to, but right now I can only listen to positive and constructive things. So if, if it's inspirational and positive, absolutely share it with me now. Otherwise we put a pin in the conversation and we can talk about another moment. And that, you know, she kind of looked like a little surprised, but I mean, I said it in a loving way. And mm -hmm. then, you know, she just didn't share it. And you know what? That's a happen. It's like, if you don't protect yourself, what are you going to get? You know, I love of that every day. That is just wonderful, Jessica, because I was going to ask you about this because sometimes you set boundaries with these little white lies, you know, like, like you, the example you gave, you know, like someone calls you, you know, like maybe you arranged, you know, a dinner or something, an appointment two weeks ago, it's the day of, or two days before. And you're like, I don't feel like going. And just, I'm not feeling it this week. Something emotionally is telling you physically, mentally, whatever it is, <clears throat> excuse me. And for me, it used to be hard to, to call them up and say, you know what? I'm not feeling it anymore. I know we made this commitment two weeks ago. And so I would make up an excuse and I would be like, you know, I can't go now because X, Y, and Z happened, you know, or whatever. And I told myself that I wanted to start speaking the truth because if I'm doing these little white lies and I put these in air quotes because they're not really yeah. hurting anyone, but it's just feeding more into that space of not standing for what we need at that moment and giving permission mm -hmm. to other women to do the same thing. So I love yeah. the story of how you said that you protect your, you protected yourself by saying, Hey, if this is not going to further the conversation, let's put a pen on it because I, I don't have a, the bandwidth to, to, to process that right now. And yeah. I've been practicing this more in these last couple of years. And what I've noticed, even though at the beginning, it was a little bit harder to say, mm -hmm. you know, because it was scary, like, oh my God, am I going to lose a friend? Are they never going to invite me again? Are they good? You know, like all these different, you know, fear thoughts. Now I come from a place of like, you know what? It's Sunday afternoon. I don't want to go out Sunday afternoons. I feel like I just want to be at home in my pajamas and that's how I'm doing, you know, and I'll just share with them. Yeah. And then it just opens up the space for them. It gives them permission to say, wow, that's pretty cool. Now I know I can say the same thing to Tanya, you know, yeah. like, or even like when I ask, when I ask for help or a request, like I was just asking our neighbor to, if she could pick up the mail for us. And I don't want to put her in a, in a commitment that she has to give me that white lie. I said, could you pick up the mail? We're going to be gone for 10 days. Could you pick up the mail? And I want you to have room to say no if this is not convenient for you right now, because I feel like a lot of women, sometimes, you know, it's like that excuse mm. and because they don't have the capacity or they haven't strengthened that muscle enough. But I love that. That was such a beautiful way of saying that as an example for all of us listening on how yeah. we can start setting those boundaries, checking in with ourselves, aligning with our values. And as we're wrapping up, Jessa, tell us a little bit about your app, 
where people can find you. I also want to hear you. I know you have a book coming out. We'll put these things yeah. in the notes, please. You know, like, as I want yeah. everyone to come to Jess's app, whether you have a condition, you know, someone that's had a condition, you know, if they're alternative therapies, but share with us a little bit what the app's about, what people can get out of it and why it's beneficial for everyone, whether you have a condition, you don't yeah. have a condition or what exactly. kind of alternative therapies you've been doing. Yeah. So basically the app, I mean, you can find it at youarethehero.com. And from there, it's a landing page that will explain the benefits for both the, for both people who want to need a resource or want to share their resources and their stories in benefit of others and the professionals of health and wellness who can, who want to help. Right. So if you go to that website, then you'll find the way to access the app store to go and download the app. And if you're a professional, you'll find the place to sign up and register and then sign in. But basically, I mean, the app is, is a resource that I, it's the resource I would have liked to have had the resource and community that I would have liked to have had when I started my process, my adversity, or also even just to practice these things about like, you know, uh, looking at your values, figuring out if you're aligned. It's like, it's, it's also for people that are just looking to, you know, just live a happier life, you know, and, and, or be healthier, or just have more wellness in their lives, you know, but yeah, it brings you through the lens of the stories of people. It brings you the health and wellness experts that you need through these empowering stories that are going to empower you and help you unleash that inner hero you have. So basically, if you're going through something, you would go and you just you register and it takes you to the search page. You, you search any word. It could be COVID. It could be divorce. It could be I mean, anything. And you're going to find stories. And they're all written with very inspirational and constructive tone. Why? Because there's a storytelling tool in the app for people when they write the story and when they write a referral of a health and wellness professional, they're writing it in such a way based on the app is, is, is giving some tips and tricks on how to write the story, which is also actually very healing and empowering in itself because it asks you questions to help you realize how you have managed a situation. No, and, and it's not really, you don't necessarily like to write your story. You don't necessarily have had to overcome what you've been through. Like, like I said, I'm still kind of in, in my process. process, but, but the per the point is it's how you, everyone has that inner hero that allows us to decide how we relate to our circumstance. Right. So yes, I have this going on, but I've decided to transform it into something beautiful and positive. And I've decided that, you know, when I don't feel when I'm tired or the medicine is making me feel crappy or whatever, then that's a moment for me to relax. And then I'm going to make the most of that moment. So we all have the power to decide. It's, it's, I call it, it's like responsibility is ability to respond. We all have that in, in ourselves, no? So yeah, so you can find those stories. You can find through the stories, you can find referrals that those people have made to their favorite professionals of health and wellness. And then you can again find the health and wellness professionals profile, read up on the type of services they provide and actually make appointments with those health and wellness professionals or chat with them. So, and then basically you can then make appointments, do your thing. If you want, you can write a referral afterwards. You can, you know, publish your story and then, you know, send the story to someone, or you can send the app to someone that it could be useful for. The app is free for, for those that use it. There's a, a section in the app where I have what we call routines. This kind of was started because of these health routines that I established for myself to work on these mental and emotional pieces, like looking at your values or figuring out how to manage uncertainty or figuring out how to deal with fear. Psychologists and others co and coaches have written these amazing daily routines, which are, they literally take like one minute to do. There are some that are free in the app and others that are, that are basically an in-app purchase, but if you pay it once for it. It's very small, like $4 type of thing. And what they do is you have access to it for the rest of your life. So you can, it's like, it might be a 40 day routine where you go through, it's based on co coaching methodology, which, which is based on 
sharing with you some information and then asking you a question that allows you to build a new perspective. So it takes you through this process where you integrate concepts during maybe 30 days and you don't have to do it every day if you don't want to, but it's kind of like the point is do, you know, if you can do it every day, it's just a minute and it's like you, it gives you a new perspective that you can take through your day and and allows you to see things differently and then it builds on each day now so you can sign up for those routines it's also a way for you to kind of continue the work that you might start with a professional you might go to a therapist and then say oh you know what between appointments i'm going to continue working on these things so so, um, yeah and uh, so it's kind of like a companion and then all of that gets stored on your wall so you have this beautiful kind of board or wall where all the output from those routines get stored. Some of the routines ask you to upload an image and write a text, or maybe write something on a post-it. And so you choose the color of the post-it or whatever. And then on the board, you can also pin your favorite professionals that you've come across while you're reading stories and referrals and your favorite stories written by other people. And I call them heroes, the users of the app that, that have most impacted you. And then that way you can always go back to the, their profiles and kind of see if they've written something new, you know, and then the app is also going to suggest to you other stories that are related to things that you've been looking at. You know? So it's for that. everyone. It's for those going through things, those who, who want to just, you know, do learn self introspection, whatever caretakers, family members, you know, someone who has a loved one who's going through something. I mean, really, I love it's it really for everybody. Yeah. I love it, Jessa. And I love that it, that you've, it's basically you're tapping into the collective intelligence, you know, everyone that's submitting and and having it in. It's great. So you are the hero is the name of the app. So for anyone right now, it's only on Apple. You said it's It's not not for Android yet, but it will be coming out. And yeah, just yeah. for all of you that are listening, she's having this in Spanish and Portuguese too. So it will be expanding. You know, you can reach other people if you're like, oh, this would be great for my grandma that lives in Mexico. Yeah. You know, she can tap into it too. So yeah. Jessa, as we're wrapping up, I want to ask you one last question. What is one thing our listeners could do to live a life with more courage? Oh, to live a life with more courage, I think we need to stop. We need to get off the hamster wheel, (laughs) reconnect with our essence, reconnect with, with who we are really, with our values, reconnect with that inner hero that allows us to have the strength to act upon those values. And lastly, reconnect with humanity, because I feel that we live very much like individualistic lives where we don't realize that we're all there is a common thread that that you know is is uniting everybody right and and that's what the book that i wrote is is about that's going to be published now it's called the great reconnection because i really feel that there's so many activities around empowering women and you know black lives matter and this and that and that it's like and i understand why and i'm a big promoter of all of these things and i think i understand why we focus on a specific group of people so that we can see some very concrete results. But I feel that 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 brings a lot of segregation, right? So you have, when you do things for women, like in in a company, you know, and you say, okay, women leadership activities. Well, then what about the men? And then it's like, you know, Black Lives Matter. Well, what about the Hispanics? Well, what about the, you know, whatever? It's like, and Mm -hmm. you think, well, you know, shouldn't we all be coming together, right? And so I think that's what this is also all about. And and when you when you start doing things in service of and in things with a lot of with a significance like a social impact significance i think that it's just so fulfilling and so yeah i would say those three pieces you know reconnect with your essence with your inner hero and with with humanity and I and it. not only are you going to be find joy you're going to be happy and and you know you're going to make the world a better place so and live a life with more yeah. courage. I love it. Exactly. Thank you, Jessa. Exactly. Thank you so yeah. much for you. You you you're just like emanating just beauty and love. I can sense that from just the inside <laughs> out. So thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh. I so appreciate you. Thanks to you. Thanks to you. <laughs> I am so grateful that you joined me for this episode. As my way to thank you, I'd like to invite you to my free week-long Manifesting Abundance Challenge that's going on this week. 
There's still time to join. You can come live to the calls or listen to the recordings if you need to catch up. It's a wonderful way to raise your energy and vibration so that you become more attractive and magnetic. I'll be sharing tips and practices that took my first cohort at 25 women to raise over $1.2 million collectively in just eight weeks. You can sign up for this free week-long challenge with the link in the show notes. I look forward to seeing you there.